So, all of you, um, welcome to Woodstock. I'm Mimi Baird and I live here. And this is an honor today uh, to be participating in Bookstock. Now you all know that Bookstock um, is run strictly by volunteers. Everything is free. And um, so if you feel so inclined on your way out, there's a little delicate crystal dish there that you could pop something in that would help out. Um, but we want to acknowledge the organizations that have supported Bookstock. One is the uh, Jack and Dorothy Byrne Foundation, the Pauline Davenport Children's Fund of the Community, Vermont Community Foundation, the Vermont Humanities Council, the Woodstock Learning Lab, and with special thanks to our media sponsor, which is the uh, wonderful Vermont Standard. Macy Lawrence here is a WCTV 8, our Woodstock Community Television, and he tapes all the sessions so in the winter we can revisit Bookstock. And uh, the Yankee Bookstore, which is in the village, um, is the oldest independence bookstore in Vermont, and Sustainable Woodstock. And um, so I, that's that. And uh, now we can get on to the, <laughs> the serious matter here, which is Christina Thompson. And um, I'm sure you've all read the description of of her background. Uh, do you want me to go through it again or no? <laughs> I'll give them back. I'll give them enough background. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, because it really, you really should, because I want to have maximum time with her and maximum time for you to ask questions. Uh, there is a speaker afterwards, so we normally have, would have the speaker talk for about a half an hour and then allow 10 minutes for questions. And I may be rude to have to cut you off, but we have to do that so we can rearrange everything for, for the last speaker. So, uh, Christina, I'm going to let you Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, it's a book about the Pacific. It's about the settlement of what's sometimes known as remote Oceania. It's about the prehistory of Polynesia. Now, I'm from Boston. And so a lot of people have wondered why I have written this book. Um, and the answer, um, as I have been asked to figure this out, I have come up with a number of different answers, and this is the one I like best. So I went to, after I left Boston, I went to Australia, where I lived for 15 years. And when I was in Australia, I went to graduate school there, I became um, exposed to the Pacific, Pacific literature, the history, the people. Then I met a man who is a Maori. He's an indigenous Polynesian from New Zealand. And we got married. We're still married. We have three sons. And I wrote my first book um, about my encounter with the Pacific, about being a person from far away from the Pacific and coming to the Pacific sort of for the first time and trying to understand its history. And sort of I wove that, um, that history of what is strictly speaking in the business kind of called the contact history between outsiders coming into the Pacific and the people who were already there. I wove that story together with the story of my marriage because that was the same thing in my mind. It was sort of, you know, these people coming from really different places, really different parts of the world and the cult sort of culture clash that was involved that way. So there's one chapter in that book. That book is called Come on Shore and We Will Kill and Eat You All. That is actually a quote of, from Charles Darwin. It's Charles Darwin misquoting Captain Cook, but you have to read the book in order to understand how that works. <laughs> There's a chapter in that book, which is strictly speaking, I think, a memoir, which is the chapter is called Hawaii, and it's about, it's set in Honolulu, and it's about a little brief period in our lives when I was there as a post-doctoral uh, fellow, and my husband, and we had one child at that time, a baby, and my husband's father died, and so he had to go back to New Zealand for the funeral. So there I was left in Honolulu, and my husband had gone off to New Zealand, and I began to think about the relationship of New Zealand to Hawaii. And of course, I knew this big backstory. I knew it in general terms about how New Ze people of the indigenous people of New Zealand are very closely related. They are cousins, effectively, of the people, the indigenous people of Hawaiian, Hawaii, the Hawaiians. These people are all Polynesians, and there are other people in the Pacific who are also Polynesians. And I began to think about that, not in a very sophisticated way, but sort of thinking. So then when I was done with that book and I was casting about for the next thing to write, 
I started thinking, well, I might tell that story. I might tell that story about how those people are connected. <coughs> and then I realized, really, I thought, look, I'm going to tell the epic history of the Polynesian diaspora, the peopling of the Pacific, of the remote Pacific. And I thought, and it, it, what happened was that I realized that if you're going to tell that story, if you're just going to tell that story straight as a history, it's a novel. It's basically Moana. You know, like Disney's Moana, that's what that is. For me, um, I wasn't going to write that. That wasn't what I do. So I started thinking, okay, okay, we can't really know a lot of this stuff because it's in prehistory. We don't have any direct access to it at all. There's no written documentation from that period. These things happened more than a thousand years ago. You know, how do we know? So that question of how do we know became, that's the tonic note for this book. How do we know? How do we know what happened? And it turned out that as I started looking into it, um, there were, you know, you, you have to understand, I was, I was thinking maybe you could look at the Pacific on your phone. <laughs> if you just Googled Pacific Ocean, you would, you would get a map that would show you um, something about it. Because the thing you have to understand about this story is that the Pacific is enormous, right? I mean, usually when I tell, when I do this, I have maps, I have maps up here and I, I show you maps. I mean, I have a map here in the beginning of the book to show you kind of how big the Pacific is. The Pacific is more than 12,000 miles across in the middle. So that if you look at the globe, you actually, at its widest point, cannot see both sides of it at the same time. There's more than half the circumference of the globe. It's also 10,000 miles top to bottom. It's really huge. And so the distances inside here from place to place are really, really, really enormous. Right? And the Polynesian Triangle is this area in the middle from Hawaii to New Zealand to Easter Island. And that's the area, in fact, I could just pass this around if you wanted, I don't know. Um, that's the area that we are sort of talking about is this Polynesian Triangle. Now, this question of how do we know, how do we know what happened? So we have, what, the, the story is kind of like this, is one way to pitch it is, is sort of, Europeans sail into the Pacific in the 16th century. Magellan is the first one to sail across the Pacific in the 1520s. And he misses everything. I mean, he doesn't find anything. He doesn't find any of the islands I'm going to be talking about. But then he's followed by other people, the Spanish and the Portuguese in the 16th century, and then the Dutch in the 17th century, and then the British and the French, and sometimes some Russians and some Germans later on. And basically, Little by little, the, 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 the islands are discovered. And when the, the, the Europeans are actually looking for something called Terra Australis Incognita. They're looking for a huge continent, which they believe lies in the Pacific Basin. And they think that for hundreds and hundreds of years. It's actually an, uh, an idea from antiquity, which is carried into the modern era. Well, that continent doesn't exist. There is no Terra Australis Incognita. And so the people who, the Europeans who sail into the Pacific, century after century, are looking for it, never find it, and instead they find these little islands. And the thing that happens is, when they find these little islands, they discover that the islands are inhabited. And so it's like, you know, again, where do these people come from and who are they? Putting that story together, putting that story together, what I decided to do was to tell it chronologically. I decided to start with the first, what I think of as the first data point, the first piece of evidence that I could find that would help answer these questions. Who are these people? Where did they come from? How did they get there? When did that happen? So this cluster of questions about who Polynesians are and where they came from. The first piece of kind of data that we have, the first evidence we have for this, is basically the eyewitness reports of those European explorers, because before that, there's just Polynesians out in the Pacific, islanders out in the Pacific, and they have their own ideas, of course, about who they are and where they came from. But nobody outside the Pacific has any access to that. Nobody knows what that is. So the first data point is someone like Rochevein, a kind of Dutch explorer who comes and finds Easter Island, and he's the first guy to kind of tell us about those statues. So we have people observing this, or, or Mendania, who comes in in the 16th century in 1595 and discovers the Marquesas, little by little piecing together, right? Subsequently, after the explorers, after sort of the Pacific has been what you might call opened in that sense, it's become known to the outside world, 
Then lots of people arrive, whalers, sealers, traders, merchants, missionaries. You know, all these people arrive in the Pacific in the 19th century. The 19th century is the great century of contact in the Pacific. And it is, of course, a cataclysmic century for islanders. These outsiders bring epidemic disease. People are wiped out. The, 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 sort of, the most extreme example of this is the Marquesas. Maybe 50,000 people in the Marquesas, which are not too far from Tahiti, before contact, maybe 50,000. At 1900, say, or 1910, there are under 2,000 people left. And no one has gone around shooting them. They haven't been murdered, exactly, but they have died. They have died and died and died from smallpox and venereal disease, not venereal disease, that reduces their fertility, but smallpox and dysentery and, I don't know, you know, everything you can, measles and, Influenza, I don't know. So it's a tough century for islanders because of the kind of chaos that, is, that erupts as a consequence of all these people coming from outside. In that period, what's really interesting from my point of view, from my story, is that it's the beginning of the 19th century that you start to get enough conversation between islanders and outsiders enough language skills between islanders and outsiders to be able to document what the Polynesian people think themselves. So people come and they say, who are you? Where did you come from? And Polynesians have answers to these questions. Now, they're not the answers that you're looking for. They're not necessarily the answers you're looking for, the answers that you're expecting. We come from Te Po, which is the darkness, the origin, the primordial darkness. You know, I mean, there are some really great answers. There really, and there's a whole section of the book which is really about what do Polynesians say about where they came from and what islands they came from and what, pa what passages they took. And it takes Europeans a long time, takes outsiders a long time to try and decode this information because it's really foreign to them. Not just, it's foreign conceptually in, a in addition to just in the language. Then, of course, in the 20th century, we have what I refer to as the rise of science. And now, all of a sudden, we have anthropologists in the Pacific, and they're starting to do interesting things. They're doing more sophisticated linguistics than was done earlier. They're looking at archaeological stuff. And then in the 19, late 1940s, early 1950s, you get radiocarbon dating, which is like, you know, the light goes on in one way, is you get dates, actual dates. But there's all kinds of other kind of scientific approaches. At one point, people are measuring bodies to try and figure out how, you know, where did Polynesians come from? If we measure their arm span, is that going to tell us you know, who they are. I mean, it's kind of complicated, all this stuff. And then at the very end, what happens is, through a series of events um, that I'm not going to really explain right now, a bunch of people get the idea, and, and you will all remember Tor Haradol, yeah. right, and Kontiki. Kontiki is the one thing that absolutely everybody knows about this subject. So Kontiki is the first guy to try and reenact the voyages. And there is a whole, in the late 20th century, from the 1970s onwards, there is a whole long, fabulous, experimental voyaging movement. Kontiki is not a particularly good example, but it is, the idea is there. And then people build canoes and they start to sail them. And um, in two years ago, I actually went onto the famous canoe, the Hokulea, which is, had sailed around the world at that point and with non-instrumental navigation. So, you know, that, that movement, it's in Hawaii, localized in Hawaii mainly, and it's really been fantastic. It's really been amazing. So the idea behind the book is that this is sort of a puzzle and that there are all these different pieces of the puzzle. You know, there's the things that people saw and the things that they, and the, and the, and the numbers that they were able to get on the dates, and there's the, like the bits of mythology, and then there's the experimental voyaging. And as you sort of piece it all together, the, the bigger picture really becomes clear in theory. There are also a lot of uh, false paths. There are a lot of, um, one of the things that, <clears throat> one of the things that was thought in the 19th century was an idea in the 19th century which became, uh, uh, it, 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 everybody believed this. And if you open up a book from 1920 about the Pacific, it will say this in the book, or from 1880. The idea was this. In the 19th century, do you know Indo-European, the idea of Indo-European languages? Okay, well, so languages exist in families. 
So, you know, the Germanic languages, Dutch and English and German, you know, they're all closely related. Or Italian, French, and Spanish, they're all closely related. Well, all these groups of languages kind of form families. And in the 19th century, this idea was discovered by these linguists, German philologists, right? And it was a fantastic idea because it revealed the relatedness of things that are like Sanskrit and Armenian. I mean, you might not see that on the surface, but through this kind of diligent comparative linguistics, people figured this stuff out. They also had, they began to think, well, what other languages can we look at? What other languages might be related to this? And some very famous German theorists said, oh, well, there are these Polynesian languages. And they decided that the Polynesian languages were a branch of Sanskrit. I hope this sounds implausible, <laughs> because it is implausible. It is highly implausible, but it was an article of faith for almost 100 years that, that Polynesian languages, Oshis, Oceanic languages, were a branch of Sanskrit, and therefore Polynesians were Aryans, to use the old terminology. Aryan meaning the tribes people, the Indo-Aryans, herders and horsemen who lived in sort of the, the steppes, the Eurasian steppes at the five or 6,000 years ago. So they were a branch of those people. I mean, it's like, really? Are you kidding? <laughs> so, but, but, so, so you find this old language. So I followed this line for a while because I was so interested in the idea that you could get something so wrong and it could then determine so much thinking for a long time. And I'll give you an example of what it did. There was a guy named Terangi Hiroa, also known as Peter Buck. He was a Maori anthropologist. He lived in New Zealand, and he became, at one point, the director of the Bishop Museum in Honolulu, and therefore a professor of anthropology at Yale. Okay, he was half Maori and half Anglo-English, or Anglo, what do they call that? Irish Protestant, <laughs> I think is what I mean. Um, Anglo irish is what I was trying to say. So um, he's half and half, mother and father, and um, he has this incredibly wonderful celebrated career. He becomes the director of the Bishop Museum, and at some point, he wants to become an American citizen. About 1940, maybe, before the war, or maybe it happens right after the war, maybe it's in the early 50s, can't remember exactly now. And the US government says, no, because you are Asian. And he says, no, even my Maori side, I am 100% Caucasian because he thinks that his Maori side comes from this Aryan ancestry, which is the same as sort of Caucasian, the Caucasus, you know, it's, it's all tangled up in this terminology. And they say, no, you're not, you're Asian. I mean, it's ridiculous. And he is denied US citizenship despite being a professor at Yale University on these grounds because there's this prohibition against people who have Asian ancestry becoming US citizens for some, you have to have more than 50% Caucasian. Like, really? Wow. Okay, so I did follow a lot of, uh, I did went down a lot of rabbit holes. Um, I followed a lot of funny paths. I tried to tell it in a way so that it would be entertaining, um, uh, fast. I don't want it to be slow. I, I think that you will find that it's not a, a slow book. Some people, when they finish reading it, they tell you it was fast, and then you think, it took me 10 years. <laughs> and you read it fast? <laughs> Is that good? <laughs> so I'm gonna tell you one little story, one other story, one main story, and this is a puzzle piece. This is a puzzle piece from early in the book. So this is back at the time when we don't yet know who these people are. We don't really yet know that there are all these islands out there. This is back when the Europeans are sort of still sailing back and forth across the Pacific trying to figure out what is out there. You know, it's because the Pacific is so big and because there are these particular patterns of winds and currents that it's actually very difficult, if you're under sail especially. It's very difficult. You, you can't go just anywhere you want. You have to go where the wind allows you to go. So. It's actually quite a difficult problem. It takes them hundreds of years to figure it out. And at, it really gets solved, this question of who's out there, what's out there, in the 18th century. That's when this happens, when they figure it out. And, the re, and this is how it unfolds. It's kind of funny. This is the, way, this is the thing about looking at these, these stories, is you go back and you go, wow, there's a little piece in there that you didn't expect. So in... 1764, the Seven Years' War comes to an end. It's the same as the French and Indian War. That's what we call it. 
they call it Seven Years' War. And it leaves Great Britain in a position of, of power um, is strength, uh, especially naval strength. So the British start sending out expeditions. They start sending out, the Royal Navy starts sending ships out. And this first, they send out one, and then they send another one. The second one they send out, I think it's the second, they, um, is a uh, captain by a guy named um, Samuel Wallace. So Samuel Wallace goes out in the Dolphin. I think he goes in 1766, around there, 67 maybe. And by accident, of course it's always by accident, he discovers Tahiti. Now, Tahiti is right in the middle of the Pacific. It's in, in fact, when you do a map like this in a book, Tahiti is in what's called the gutter, which is the middle of the book. Tahiti is always invisible in here. Tahiti is a comparatively large island. It's very beautiful. It has all of the things you might want. It has a reef. It has a lagoon. It has, it has there are other islands around it. It's mountainous. It's very lovely. Um, it's a great island. Up until this point, no one has found an island like that in the Pacific. They have found atolls, which are flat and coral, and they are rings, and they are very kind of challenging to live on. There have been some islands discovered in the Western Pacific. But the reason this is important is this. The Royal Society and other people are extremely interested in sending out an expedition to observe the transit of Venus. Now, you've probably heard of the transit of Venus at some point. We actually had one a couple of years ago. The transit of Venus is when the, the planet Venus passes across the face of the sun, and you can see it. You can be observed by the naked eye from Earth. The duration of this event was thought to be an important piece of information in order to calculate the size of the universe, or, sorry, the size of the solar system, which is what people wanted to do. That's why they wanted this piece of information. Now, the thing about the transit is this. It has this very weird period. It happens twice in eight years, and it doesn't happen for another century. So it happened in 1761, and they had some not very satisfactory data from it, and it was coming again in 1769. And astronomers in Europe, the Royal Society, people were very, very keen to get some observers out there to measure the transit of Venus. Now, there's one other thing about the transit of Venus. You can't see it from just anywhere. You can only see it from the parts of Earth that are in daylight for the duration of the event, right? Like, you know, the same thing with other things that happen. Well, in 1761, parts of Europe had been places where you could see the transit. In 1769, the best place to see the transit was the middle of the Pacific Ocean. 1769, it's coming. 1767, Wallace returns with the news of Tahiti. And within months, like two months, Captain Cook, remember Captain Cook? Away he goes with his little ship to observe the transit of Venus because that's what they're after. So Cook gets in his little ship. He goes off to Tahiti. And then another thing happens, which is that Cook... Because he is, I, I'm a bit of a Cook fan, I have to say. He, he's a, an interesting historical figure, but he's a very orderly kind of guy. And he gets there early. And he stays there for a long time. He gets there early, he builds his fort, he does all this stuff. And what ends up happening is that he stays in Tahiti for two months. No, four months. Four months. This is in the context of 18th century encounters or 17th century encounters between Europeans and Polynesian peoples, an eternity. All of the other thing, encounters have been glancing a week, a few days, a couple of weeks, something like that. He spends four months in Tahiti. Now, this means that he comes, he, 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 and he has Joseph Banks with him, too, who's a great observer, so that helps. They manage to collect a lot more information about what's going on there so that their journals are really quite valuable as, uh, as, as, as documentary records of this period. There isn't a lot of change yet that's happened there. It's all very exciting. But the other thing that happens is that Cook becomes acquainted with a Tahitian guy named Tupaya. And Tupaya is what you was known as a Tahua. And I don't know if you've ever heard this word, but in Hawaii, if you've ever been to Hawaii, they have this thing called the big kahuna. Ringing some bells? Kahuna is the same word as the word that I just used, tahua, which basically means priest. But it doesn't just mean priest, because in the Tahitian context or in the Hawaiian context, priest is not enough of a word. It really means, Banks translates this term as man of knowledge. And, and, and uh, Tupaya is a navigator. 
He is a counselor to the chiefess in the area. He holds the he keeps the genealogy of the he keeps the local he keeps the history of the people. He is the he's the person who intercedes with the gods whenever you need something like that. I mean, he's like the man. He knows a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff. And when you look into what he did and what he was like, I think he was I think he was I think he was very smart. <laughs> it's one of the things that I think he was. Um, so Cook and Tupaya become acquainted. Tupaya gives the Europeans, these, these Englishmen, he gives them lists of islands that he knows, which later people have looked back and said, whoa, the number of islands. We didn't have any idea he knew that, that he would have known that many islands. He also makes a chart, which is one of the great artifacts of the 18th century. He makes a chart of all the islands that he knows, which the reason it's kind of so amazing is that the chart, they didn't have any, they didn't have any tradition of chart making. They didn't map, they didn't make maps. So he takes his knowledge, which is oral, so it's in the form of chant and song and litany and story, and he translates it into a graphic representation with, you know, cardinal points. I mean, it's like really an amazing translation if you think about it. Anyway, they learn a lot from him. And then, um, it's time for Cook to go. And Tupaya says, I'm coming with you. And at first Cook says no, and then Banks says that he will pay for him, so then he gets to go. So Tupaya gets on the ship with them and sails away. And you know, Polynesians were huge. They were like the greatest sailors ever. They were the greatest navigators ever. They were the sea people. So it's not totally surprising, but it's still an incredibly daring thing to have done. Cook is, has these secret instructions, which are to keep on looking for this unknown Southland, the great continent, which people are kind of starting to lose faith in, but they still need to make one last look. So he sails south from Tahiti. And then he sails west. So if you think about the map of the Pacific, if it's like this, and Tahiti's in the middle, here's South America, here's the Western, here's Asia. He goes south from Tahiti in the middle and then over this way. And what's over there is New Zealand. So that's the thing. So I'm going to read to you just a tiny bit, very short, just a page and a half, um, of the description of what happens when they get to New Zealand. And that's the point. So after this long preamble. OK. All through the month of September and into early October, the endeavor plowed westward through an utterly empty region of the sea. There was little to remark from the bird life and Banks, uh, apart from the bird life, sorry, and Banks, normally a lively reporter, was reduced to keeping track of the albatrosses and petrels. Toward the end of the month, there was a clear escalation in signs pointing to the proximity of land. Large clumps of seaweed drifted by, some in heaps as much together as would fill a large wheelbarrow. Groups of whales and seals were sighted, and a shoal of porpoises ruffled the waves, leaping over one another like a pack of hounds. The ship was hit by a short, violent squall, which was taken as a sign of land since such squalls were rarely met with on the open ocean. A Port Egmont hen, a kind of skewer, was spotted, another good indication. The color of the water seemed lighter, and Cook cautiously began to sound. Sure enough, at the end of the first week in October, a boy at the masthead called out, land. They had traveled some three and a half thousand miles since leaving Tahiti, crossing more than 20 degrees of latitude, and they were now back at 38 degrees south. The sea was colder, the sky was paler, and the land before them was high and rugged with cliffs along the foreshore and hills rising to a great chain of mountains inland. There was nothing in the geography of New Zealand to suggest that the people who lived there might have anything in common with the people in the tropical islands they had left behind. Indeed, Banks and many of the others were firmly of the opinion that they had come to the unknown Southland at last. Cook, however, was fairly sure they were approaching the land discovered by Abel Tasman in 1642. As the endeavor drew closer, they could see a great many smokes rising from points along the coastline. Cook was eager to make contact with the inhabitants, and as soon as he could, he brought the ship to anchor in a bay. Seeing some people on the shore, he directed his rowers to land near them. But as soon as the islanders spotted the boats, they vanished into the trees. Cook and his party landed and set off down the beach. But as soon as they vanished around a bend, the islanders reemerged from the forest. 
and made as if to attack one of the boats which had been left in the care of some four small boys. At this, a marine in the second boat opened fire, hitting one of the islanders, who fell instantly to the ground. The man's companions dragged him about 100 yards up the beach and then fled when they saw Cook's party, which had been alerted by the shots, racing back to the scene. The Maori, this is the people who are living in New Zealand, the Maori who had been shot through the heart was dead, and Banks took some time to scrutinize the corpse. He described him as a mid-sized man, brown skin, tattooed on one cheek in a perfect spiral. He was dressed in a fine kind of cloth that the English had not seen before. It was tied, Banks noted, exactly as shown in the engraving from Tasman's account of New Zealand. The following day, Cook tried again, this time taking two additional precautions. First, he landed with a party of Marines, and second, he took Tupaya with him. Cook wrote that he had tried to speak to the people of New Zealand in the, quote, George Island language, meaning what he knew of Tahitian, but that they had answered him by flourishing their weapons and breaking into a war dance. This, the famous Maori haka, if anyone's ever seen the All Blacks play, you will recognize this, was vividly described by Lieutenant Gore. I'm just going to read you a little quote here. About a hundred of the natives, all armed, drew themselves up in lines. Then with a regular jump from left to right and the reverse, they brandished their weapons, distorted their mouths, lolling out their tongues, and turned up the whites of their eyes, accompanied by a strong, hoarse song. Cook responded to this intimidating display by drawing up his marines and marching them up the beach with the Union Jack paraded before them. The stage was set for confrontation. And then something unexpected occurred. Tupaya stepped forward and addressed the warriors in fluent Tahitian. And to the surprise of everyone present, he was immediately understood. So the thing that you have to understand is how long, how far New away New Zealand is from Tahiti and how unlikely it seemed, it, could, it, 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 it appeared to the people that there could be any relationship between these people. This is before we knew, before anyone knew that there were, Hawaii hasn't even been discovered yet. Nobody knows yet. So they have sailed for two months. They have gone thousands of miles. They've arrived at a land that looks like Scotland. And the people in the first place, in the tropical paradise island of, of Tahiti, are incredibly similar to the people in New Zealand, in this Scotland, you know, the New Hebrides of the South, like these people in New Zealand. And they can also understand one another. So when you see people can understand one another, they're speaking the same language, I mean, you know that these are the same people. And this is basically the first time that everybody begins to understand that there is this network of people in the, into the, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean who are related to one another. And with subsequent voyages, Cook sails, goes everywhere all over the Pacific, and he, 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 he reinforces this notion. He goes to the Marquesas, he, goes to, he discovers Hawaii, he goes to Easter Island, he finds it's all, it's all the same. Everybody's all, everybody's all speaking this, basically a version of these languages. They're all the same. And that's when he says they begin to understand it is what they call one nation. There are lots and lots of people who don't even understand that, like now, that if you, people in Hawaii and people in New Zealand are the same people, basically. But OK, we, if, if, if they want to have quite just, yep. I just want to be on notice that there are 10 minutes left. Yep. However you want to use it is, is, is up to you. Um, I think I'll take questions. I have a question. Yep. So what's the latest theory so, looking at our map, I don't know if you can see it. The people who live here in this middle, in this Polynesian Triangle, came from the Asian mainland about five or six thousand years ago. Taiwan is where they can be traced. They can be traced back to Taiwan through linguistics. They have the Formosan languages, the islands of the indigenous people, not the Chinese who come into Taiwan, but the indigenous Taiwanese are related to them. These people are known as Austronesians, and they travel down through the Philippines, through Indonesia. A branch of them goes all the way to Madagascar in the Indian Ocean. Those are Austronesian people as well originally. And the other big branch of them goes north over Papua New Guinea and out into the wider Pacific. It takes, they get out to about here, to the edge of the triangle by about 1500 BC. There's kind of a long pause. The last islands to be settled, that would be New Zealand, about 1200 AD. It's a long, you know, it takes thousands, thousands of years, but that's basically what it is. Everything points in this direction. Heyerdahl's idea was that they came from South America. This is incorrect just so you know. 
<laughs> there are some tricky data points. There's a, they have a, the, one of the pieces, apart from the fact that they have this, um, this language family, the Austronesian language family, not the Indo-European one, but the Austronesian one, which is the one they belong to. They all these languages are kind of similar. Also, all of the, they, they, they carry with them a set of plants and animals. They have a pig, a dog, a chicken, a rat. They have coconut, they have taro, they have kumara, they have, not kumara, kumara is the one that comes from South America, but all the plants, all the other plants and food plants and everything they have with them are Southeast Asian. No written language? No written language. No metal, no written language. Any idea why it never developed? I mean, almost nobody had written language. You know, if you go back 5,000 years ago, nobody, really nobody had written. written. Writing is super recent, and it, is, it seems to have arisen spontaneously maybe three times. It is almost always um, dispersed, uh, diffused. So, you know, you have it, and then I meet you, and now I have it. It's like that. It doesn't arise spontaneously very easily. Yeah? Uh, I wanted to ask about navigation. Mm. Do we know, I, I, there was an article in the New York Times a few years ago about wave navigation. Yes, John Huth. Yeah. Yeah. Is that, do we know anything about? We do, we do, we know a lot. <laughs> and that's, that, that, um, that section, I was, that period I was telling you about where they did the, um, in the sort of late, in the 1970s where they, where they started to reenact the voyages, a lot of that story is about recovering a, a methodology or, or, or codifying a methodology of non-instrumental navigation. So not no, using, celestial. no, it's celestial for sure, but it's non-instrumental. No compasses, no sextants, no maps, no charts, no, no tools. It is, you use the stars, right? So you use a star compass, basically, which is stars rising and setting at different points on the horizon. Um, they use a whole lot of land finding um, techniques which have to do with birds. Swells are a mixture of some navigational stuff and some more land finding. There's a lot of reflection, for example, of wave reflection off of islands. And the big swells in the outer ocean have to do with um, wind directions which can are be very steady in the Pacific. So there are a whole bunch of things like that. There are a whole bunch of pieces. There are some books written about it. There are now... Um, more well, maybe two dozen, I don't know, navigators or three dozen, I don't know how many navigators there are, but lots of people who can do this. I mean, lots <laughs> more than there used to be. <laughs> so the, the knowledge had been lost in Polynesia and it was recovered largely with um, ethnographic work in Micronesia and then some other stuff that people did. Yeah? Uh, how much of that flow analysis that you just talked about a little while ago? Uh, it, uh, was known before DNA analysis, and has DNA been used to confirm any of that? Um, obviously, uh, Michener wrote about the the movement of people uh, in uh, Hawaii, Hawaii. Yeah. Uh, and uh, there seemed to be a lot of knowledge about it at that point. I guess that was the 50s when he wrote that. There's been a, there's a lot of there, the, it's been probably I mean there was. There were a lot of red herrings along the way, but I would say maybe 100 years is sort of the big, the big picture has been known for quite a while. Maybe not 100, maybe 70 or something like that. Um, but yeah, the big, the, the, that flow, that's pretty well known, well documented. And there were people way back, in the, even in the 18th century, who were already speculating about it, who had the idea. I mean, Cook's idea about it was close to correct. Um, but there just wasn't a lot of information. There wasn't a lot of way to prove it. So, so yeah. And DNA, at the moment, DNA is... Most of all of the DNA work up until a certain point, up until very, very recently, has basically just confirmed what was already known. Though it has added, it has added some interesting elements. There was a really smart um, uh, research work done by a woman in New Zealand. It, Ancient DNA is interesting because it gets you, you know, modern DNA is kind of problematic because there's been a lot of intermixing and it's complicated but ancient DNA can take you back to if you get the bones you get the bones of somebody who died a thousand years ago and you look at those it tells you some interesting stuff but a lot of people in the Pacific especially in Polynesia they don't really want anyone to do that you know they don't want people taking the bones to destroy them. so it's sensitive it's tricky but this woman said well let's look at the rats let's look at the quote commensals those are the animals that have to travel with people so those rats didn't swim by themselves from island to island if rats then people like, if there were rats, you know there were people. So they started doing DNA work on the rats, and that was really interesting. That was really smart, you know, because a way of getting around the kind of politics and the sensitivity and the emotional part of it and still. 
So that is maybe helpful in terms of telling you how many settlement events there may have been. It's not, not conclusive yet, but yeah. So are any of those islands like Vanuatu or Bali or any of those, is Bali one? Um, yeah. Are they, are any of them left somewhat primitive anymore? Any that you know of? Well, I mean, I mean, Bali is part of Indonesia and it's, you know, modern and I mean, uh, Vanuatu, I mean, I don't think there is anything, there's, there's no place in the Pacific where y y people are not living in a modern way. That's um, not the I found an beautiful picture of Vanuatu people um, in New York Times and I painted a huge painting of it. It's at the, it's on, in, it's at the Norman Williams Library right oh, now. Nice. But it, it's like. I mean, people have their traditional culture. Yeah, well, I mean, people have these cultural things, and they will, they will perform them, you know. Um, and they, in some cases, there's more. In some cases, for example, though there hasn't been much language loss, there's been much less language loss in some places than others. I mean, Hawaii and New Zealand are the, are the ones that are tough in this respect because the colonization of those two places has been very intense. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of language loss. So that's one of the measures, is are people speaking their own language or have they lost it? But I mean, they're bringing those languages back, so, but, but yeah. yeah. Why, why was there a migration? Was it overpopulation? No, it doesn't seem to have been. One of the reasons, one of the ways of knowing that is that it's, when you look at the speed with which people, you can, you can tell kind of a lot about the way they move through that from the north of Papua New Guinea out to the Pacific. There's some pretty good evidence about that. And they do seem to arrive in islands like Vanuatu, the islands of Vanuatu or New Caledonia, and then to move on before they could ever possibly have, you know, used up all the food. There's no way they can populate, overpopulate those islands because the islands are big and, you know, and yet they're moving on. So we know that they're moving on for some other reason. They're not being driven out by, by starvation. Or, I mean, I think, you know, there has, there's a cultural dimension to this. There is a desire to seek new land. There is a desire to, um, I think there's, in some cases, uh, one of the anthropologists that I like a lot described this as, as these cultures as being founder focused, meaning that there is, there is a lot of prestige in the culture for the founder. Lineages are founded on someone's name, right? So my husband, for example, belongs to a tribe called Ngapuhi, and Puhi is a guy. And so this is a people from, Nga, from Puhi. So to be Puhi, you know, is to be something really important. So there may be this desire to be a founder of a lineage, and you might do that, you know, in the same way that, you know, second sons went off to, uh, second sons in Scottish families went off to New Zealand and made ranches or whatever they did, farms. They did fight with each other? They did fight. They totally fought. That's another reason. People may have had to be, may have been expelled from their communities. But, you know, to mount a, a an expedition with enough resources, a big canoe, enough food, enough people. It wouldn't just be like, we got mad and you got mad at me and I ran away. I mean, it, it, it's a major undertaking. So, I don't know. I mean, we don't really know the answer to that. That's all the speculation. I mean, there's just kind of no way to get it. Yeah. Okay, one more question. Oh, yeah? Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. Um, are the languages written now? Yes. And what's the alphabet? Oh, we use a Roman alphabet. They've been, they were written by, they were, they were uh, written down by the missionaries in the 19th century. So the English missionaries mostly. Um, and then there's the question of orthography. There are some funny things. If you ever go to New Zealand, you'll see that the, a town like um, WH, if you've ever encountered this, but the WH in New Zealand is F, like an F. Like a town is called Whangare, W-H-A-N-G, or Whangaroa. You know, that's some kind of, I think that's some kind of representation of an aspirated W, which sounded to somebody like an F. You know, whale. You know, we, we don't say it anymore, but whale, that's an aspirated W. That's a w WH. It actually used to have a different sound in English, and I'm thinking that there's something, that's the only explanation. I mean, I don't really know, but, <laughs> but there are things like that, you know, where there's, there's um, weird spelling stuff, you know, so, yeah. Well, I guess that's it. We don't have time. Yeah? That was wonderful. <laughs>